I'm going to start off uh, giving my testimony since we're, we're in a church. And this is live streamed, and it's, it's going to be a talk on the origin of life. But I'm going to start off with my testimony because I've been asked to do that. So people are going to complain online, some people, but I should give them something to complain about. And uh, so let me just open in a word of prayer. Abba, Father, I commit this time to you. And I pray for the outpouring of the Lord Jesus Christ to touch the hearts, to open the minds, and let Jesus Christ be glorified. Father, I pray for your grace and your outpouring. Thank you, my Father, for the glory of Jesus. Amen. So as far as my testimony, I grew up in a secular Jewish home. I was born in Manhattan, New York City. Uh, uh, first home in the Bronx, then grew up just north of the city. I came to know the Lord at the age of 18 when I was a, 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 uh, a freshman at Syracuse University and uh, uh, gave my heart to the Lord. Really started growing about a year and a half after that when I started going to a local church and, and uh, uh, was greatly influenced by two men, Dr. T.E. Koshi, who was the evangelical chaplain of the university and also the pastor of the church that I attended, and, and uh, his mentor, Brother Bhakt Singh from India. So I was greatly influenced by those men and really blessed to be there. And um, I love Jesus Christ with all my heart. Jesus is the best, the best, the best in every way. I am so thankful to him. And, and as a scientist, I pray that God would give me the creativity of Bezalel. Bezalel was, is mentioned in, in, in uh, chapter 31 of Exodus. It says he's the first man to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled. God says that I've called my name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom in understanding and in knowledge of all kinds of craftsmanship. So he gave him first wisdom, and then he gave him understanding, and last of all, he gave him knowledge. Because if we, if we go, if we just have knowledge without the wisdom from God, sometimes dastardly things could be done with it. And, uh, um, and so I pray, Lord, give me the creativity of, of Bezalel. Give my students the creativity of Bezalel. Bezalel was the man that Moses commissioned to build the tabernacle. Uh, uh, and it said he could work in gold, in silver, and in bronze, in stone cutting and in stone setting. He could work in wood, in fabric, in perfuming, and he had the ability to teach it. I ta it's talked about in Exodus 31 and in Exodus chapter 36. And, and uh, um, this is what I, I want to see, and I want to bring glory to God in all of my work. And this is what I, do, uh, I really try to do. I want to bring glory to my Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. With that, I'm going to start talking about origin of life, and uh, uh, I cannot be dispassionate on this subject. People have written to me that I should be more dispassionate. I cannot. I'm a Jew from New York. I used to box, and I just don't know how to, how to pull the punches. I just don't. So I'm not upset. I'm not angry. People can continue to say that I'm upset and angry. I'm not upset. I'm not angry. I'm actually enjoying this not upset at all, and I'm not angry, and uh, uh, if I raise my voice, it's not because I'm shouting at anybody, I'm just saying, I mean, do you think Jesus said to the Pharisees, uh, you brood of vipers? <laughs> I mean, come on, and Jesus didn't just say that, John the Baptist said it to them too, he called them brood of vipers, I've never called any of my colleagues, any of the scientists brood of, of a brood of viper, never, never. Uh, uh, Stephen, Stephen, when he was about to be stoned, he said, you stiff-necked people. And he said that to the Sanhedrin and the high priest. I've never said to my colleagues that they're stiff-necked or anything. I've never done that. So, so compared to the scriptures, I'm actually quite sedate. And uh, uh, so this is where we are. Origin of life research is a scam. I love that quote. That is a quote by Professor Lee Cronin. He says that, you know, just in a recent video, he said that he wants to have a deceased a, a, de a, a desist letter written to, to, so, so that I stop quoting him. I don't know how you can get somebody to stop quoting you. I mean, you're a lawyer. I mean, I, I, can you imagine somebody says they're going to cease and desist from quoting me? I mean, 
I'm not sure that's going to work. Origin of life research is a scam. And then he says, well, I said it a year later. He says, well, I was saying it tongue in cheek. And recently he says that he was saying it because he had had too much wine to drink that night. So we'll look at his explanation of what he meant when he said origin of life research is a scam. But I think it's a great quote. So let me go over some definitions. Abiogenesis is the origin of life from non-living matter. To construct any convincing theory of abiogenesis, we must take into account the conditions of the Earth about four billion years ago. Again, not my definition. It's textbook definition. Prebiotically relevant means that we are restricted to materials, procedures, and conditions that might have been available on an early Earth. So if we say it's prebiotically relevant, you've got to be able to do it on an early Earth, not in a modern laboratory. Nobody was present at life's origin, so we'll never know how life originated. But that's not what we're seeking to answer. What we are seeking is an experimentally verifiable hypothesis as to how life might have originated. That's what we are seeking. Now, some people say, well, we should just take what the Bible says and leave it at that. No, no, no. Science fills in lots of details. God just you know, gives overview on some things, and science fills in details. This is what science does. And so it takes from the book of nature and allows us to fill in details. That's what science does. So I think it's great for science to do this. All right, textbook characteristics of life, responsiveness to the environment, growth and change, ability to reproduce, have a metabolism and breathe, maintain homeostasis, being made of cells and passing traits onto offspring. Homeostasis is the steady internal physical and chemical condition. Let me just turn this down a little bit. Okay. Professor Cronin is the Regis Chair of Chemistry in the School of Chemistry at the University of Glasgow. And he has said, and I agree with him, we agree on this. I'd like to ask you all a question, which is, what is the most basic unit of matter that can undergo Darwinian evolution that you know of? And I suppose it won't be much of a surprise to see that it is a cell. So what are the requirements for our living system? We need genetic code, we need mating, we need metabolism, we need adaptation, we need homeostasis. So Professor Cronin knows very well exactly what we need. And, and I'm going to focus in on, on Lee, and the reason I'm focusing in on Lee is because, um, uh, uh, because he's probably the, the most vocal in, in, in talking about what I have to say and uh, uh, wanting to dismiss me because I'm one of those creationists. So, so uh, uh, they'd like to dismiss me on that point. Although I never bring in God into this argument. I never do. Other people do. Other people do on my behalf. I never bring in God into this argument because the science itself screams out that the science is not working for the origin of life. I never bring in God of the gap saying because we can't understand, we bring in God. That, that a scientist does not do. And the reason we don't do that is because I don't know where science will be in 100 years. Maybe there's, there's some things we can't explain today. The origin of life cannot be explained today. That doesn't mean that we won't be able to explain it in 100 years or 200 years or 500 years. I can't predict the future. If you had asked a man in 1700, will we ever be able to go to the moon? What could he say? If he had said, no way, no way, he'd have been wrong. So we don't know what the future holds. So I never use that argument, that God of the gaps argument. Chemistry is the language of living systems. You have to have the small molecules, you have to have the polymers made from them. The small molecules are monomeric sugars, go to the polysaccharides, amino acids, go to the polypeptides, uh, nucleotides, go to the polynucleotides, and glycerol goes to the lipids. And so you have to have the small molecules, which are the building blocks of the building blocks, and then you have to have the building blocks themselves. But molecules don't care about life. <coughs> molecules don't care about life. They have never been interested in life. They don't know to move toward life. They don't have a brain. Molecules don't have a brain. They don't know that to go toward life. If you put a bunch of molecules together that are specially designed, they, they can assemble, sometimes assemble on surfaces to give you regular patterns on a surface, which is not what a cell is. Molecules have never been known to move toward life unless a living system, a living organism is working upon them, a living organism like a person or like a cell or like an animal. Unless a living organism is working on these molecules, they've never been known to move toward life. They don't have brains. They don't know to. They have no motivation to move toward life. There's three basic approaches to discussing origin of life. You force, one could be you force chemical reactions toward life, 
and it's not working very well. Professor Eshen Moses Sostek, Benner, Sutherland, Christian Murphy, and many others, including the older work of Professor Cronin, avoid reaction chemistry because they realize it's not moving toward life, which is what Professor Cronin is now doing. And now other people are trying to follow his lead. Hey, look, we're trying to put these molecules together. It's not really going toward life very well. So let's stop talking about the molecules. It's just, just too much. It's too confusing. We'll talk about these general, general things and fluffy things, and we'll see if that gets us toward life. Well, I suggest we don't yet sufficiently understand reaction chemistry to see its project, projection toward life. There are enormous scientific mysteries yet to unfold. We do synthetic chemistry painfully in a laboratory. You work toward making these molecules, and you try this, you try that, you modify these Whereas in natural systems, they get 99.999% yield very easily. There's something about reaction chemistry that we're just not very good at yet as human beings. We need to understand more. Has the public been misled on the origin of life claims? Well, uh, uh, there, there's these, these uh, surveys that have been done under simulation of early Earth atmosphere. Scientists have mixed molecules together in laboratories to produce complex life forms such as frogs. One third of the general public believes that is true. The answer to that is false. They haven't. How about this? Under simulation of early Earth's atmosphere, scientists have mixed molecules together in laboratories to produce sing single-celled life forms such as bacteria. Two-thirds of the general public thinks that that is true. That is false. Not even close. Not even close. People have never produced life in a laboratory, ever. That's not to say that they won't. That's not to say that they can't. It's just to say that they haven't yet. And they're very far from being able to do that. There's mixed messaging coming from the origin of life community itself. Jack Sostek, who used to be at Harvard, is now at the University of Chicago, a Nobel Prize winner, a very nice man. I've spoken with him. He's a nice man. He said, it says right here in this article, which was written, that was, uh, written on, uh, in 2014, reported uh, on, on uh, June 3rd, 2013. You've heard it first, announced World Science Festival moderator and astrophysicist Mario Livio. As Harvard biologist and Nobel laureate Jack Sostek told the Search for Life gathering of 50 on Saturday afternoon in New York, they expected to make life in the lab in three to five years, and more likely within three years. That was in 2014. Hadn't succeeded yet. Harvard astronomer and Origin of Life initiator, initiative director Dimitar Seselov said that it's going to be, he thinks, more like five years and not three years. Well, they're not there yet. Professor Sostek, in 2021, to a group of scientists now, not the general public, to a group of scientists, said this. He's not even yet made RNA in a prebiotically relevant manner. It hydrolyzes too rapidly. And so he goes through. You mean, this is a quote of his, but that, there's the summary up top. He can't even make the RNA yet. And if you could make the RNA, that's not life. And the RNA is not stable. It doesn't stay around very long, and that's what he's saying. By intramolecular 2 prime hydroxyl on the phosphate. I'll show you what that means in a minute. And, and, and what this, what, you don't have millions of years. You actually don't even have more than a few hours. That's it. And so he's not even made one of the, the, these polymeric components yet. And yet he was saying several years before, I'll make life in the lab in three years. Now he's backed off that. But this is what the mixed messaging is. This is what goes out to the public. Steve Benner, a former Harvard professor and now director of the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution, said to a YouTuber in 2021, I suppose most of the, uh, I, I, I suppose m many of the big paradoxes in origin of life have been solved. Many of the big paradoxes in origin of life have been solved, is what he said. Well, Here's what he said in a professional meeting in 2019. Chemistry is actually hard to get to work. The molecules precipitate, the molecules hydrolyze, the molecules decompose, and so it's very much a constraint that you have to deal with. It's one goddamn problem after another, and that's exactly what it is. The molecules decompose, the molecules hydrolyze. They fall apart. That's the true word. Why is it to the experts they say one thing and that to the general public they say another? Why is that? You think that's why the general public is confused? How about Lee Cronin in a TED Talk in 2011? He said, 
And he said, what I'm going to try to do in the next 15 minutes or so is tell you about an idea of how we're going to make matter come alive. Chris Anderson, at the end of the talk, said, just a quick question on timeline. You believe you're going to be successful in this project? When? Lee Cronin, hopefully within the next two years. That was in 2011. How's it going, Lee? This is the problem. Is it any wonder that the public has been misled on the current state of origin of life proposals? Who, perchance, might have misled them? It wasn't just the press. It was the scientists themselves have been misleading the general public on the origin of life. Scientists themselves. What's the real state of origin of life research? The underlying theme here is going to be prebiotic chemistry as we know it does not move toward life. Maybe in 200 years we'll have some information to show how molecules can move toward life. But right now, never happened, never been shown. In modern laboratories, not under prebiotic conditions, using all modern methods, nobody's ever created life. That's not to say that it can't be done. As a scientist, I could never say that. I could never say it. Because the Bible doesn't say that people will never be able to make life. It doesn't. And as a scientist, I can't say that because I don't know what the future holds. So as a Christian, I can't say that. And as a scientist, I can't say that. Nobody has ever shown a method all right? This underlying theme, I want you to think about how many times I'm going to say this word, nobody. Nobody has shown a method to make the enantiopure versions of carbohydrates, amino acids, nucleotides, or lipids in a prebiotically relevant manner. These are the four building blocks of the building blocks. Uh, at least these three are. So here's a monomeric sugar. This is, this is glucose. This is an amino acid. Here, here's a nucleotide. And uh, 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 here's a lipid. All of these have stereocenters. Nobody has ever been able to make these in a prebiotically relevant manner that controls this stereochemistry. Miller-Urey could make some of these, but never with control of stereochemistry, which we know now because of chiral-induced spin selectivity that you have to have had that before life could have started. It's not an afterthought with life. Just think about this one monomeric sugar, glucose. That's glucose. Think about what nature has to go through to make this. People. YouTubers will claim, oh, well, the formless reaction makes, make, makes glucose for you. There, there it is. No, it makes a bazillion molecules along with glucose, and therefore it becomes unusable because you don't have constrained chemistry. Here's what nature has to go through to make that one little molecule. It uses 11 enzymes, four of those unique enzymes just to glucose synthesis, and four activators. Here, they're all listed here, 14, uh, 11 and 4, so you've got 15 different pieces. All of these are enzymes that are used to make that one little molecule. That's what natural systems have to go through to make that. And so if you think about the possibility of having all of these systems here, that's one in 10, one to, uh, uh, 10 to the power of 6,500, uh, uh, 65,459. What does that mean? If you have a number bigger than 10 to the 40th, 10 with a 40, that means that you cannot find that in all the time of our universe. The 14 billion years that it's estimated that the universe has been around, you cannot find it. That's 1 in 10 to the 40th. This is 1 in 10 to the 65,000. You, you could have a million, million, million universes. It wouldn't be enough time to do this. That's what nature goes through to make that small molecule glucose. And then, if you want to hook two glucoses together, you got to have this en enzyme, phosphorylase. Phosphorylase has 842 amino acids. That's 10 to the 1094. Remember, if it's more than 10 to the 40th, it can't happen in our universe. If these things are going to just happen randomly. But they say selection came around, so we'll look at that in a moment. But this is what's involved. Nobody has ever shown that the mixtures found in meteorites or interstellar space could be useful for synthesis. Nobody's ever shown it. To take the mixtures that come on meteorites and use that in chemistry. In fact, John Sutherland, who's a great origin of life researcher, he says, I don't think meteorites make the right sort of mixtures. But we need to have more constrained chemistry to actually make the right sort of mixtures. So you can say all you want that meteorites delivered this. Meteorites never deliver the constrained chemistry. Because when you have mixtures of chemistries, 
that are outside of biological systems, it can't be used because they interfere with one another. That you can take a handful of vitamins in the morning and swallow it, and then your body knows how to do work with each of those discrete chemicals that just came in your body. One multivitamin that's got like 30 different things in it, that your body knows how to segregate those and use them, is utterly amazing. Unnatural systems, pre-biological systems, cannot do that. Nobody has solved the mass transfer problem to be able to go from, from uh, small molecules to a cell. How much material would you have to have in order to bring it all along all those steps to make just a single cell? Because you run out of material. Say, say you're working on a synthesis of just one of the molecules, one of the thousand molecules that you might need for life. You're working on this synthesis, and it took you 400 million years to get there. And now you've run out of material. Well, what do you do in a laboratory? In a laboratory, you go back and you make some more. Because you look in your laboratory notebook and you say, okay, here's how I did it last time, how I optimized each shield, let me do it now. But nature never keeps a laboratory notebook. So it doesn't know how to go back. So you ran out of starting material, you're out of luck. You just can't go back because nature doesn't never kept a laboratory notebook. These are huge problems. How come nobody ever addresses this in the origin of life community? It's not that they haven't thought about this because I've brought it up many times. Nobody will touch it. Why? Because they haven't an answer. Nobody has ever shown a prebiotic route to the polymerization of amino acids, nucleotides, or carbohydrates with the required selectivity or stereo control. They will say, oh, peptides, you can just take amino acids and heat them up in water. You get a bunch of junk. Totally unconstrained cross-linked chemistry. You get a bunch of junk. You get, the same with carbohydrates, is even harder. Nu nucleic acids, very, very hard to do this. Just look at six glucoses. How would you hook together six glucoses? Well, how would you hook, how, how many different ways can you hook together six letter A's? A, 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 A. That's the only way. Six of the same units, letter A, only has one way you could hook them together in a straight line. That's it. Well, how many ways could, where each one is, is just got this, this, this double connection point? How many ways could you hook this together? How many ways? Well, with glucose, you could, it would take, it would be over one trillion ways. Over one trillion ways you can hook six glucoses together. If you have the wrong carbohydrate linkage, the cell dies. And the cells that make up the organism die. And the organism dies. How does nature do this? Using phosphorylase. That huge enzyme has one particular selectivity for this. How did this happen on a prebiotic earth? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Do you know how big a trillion is? A million seconds, one million seconds is 11 days. Okay, so you can feel that. A million seconds as well. A billion seconds is 32 years. So somebody asks you, uh, uh, will you marry me? And, and uh, you know, or you ask somebody, will you marry me? And they say, well, wait a million seconds. Okay, I'll find out in 11 days. If they say a billion seconds, I've got to wait 32 years. If they say a trillion seconds, I've got to wait 32,000 years. You see how much bigger a trillion is than a million? I, I'm, I, I'm not sure I can wait that long. It's a big problem. Nobody has ever solved the polymer stability problem when you deal with one molecule. They say, well, one molecule with the right structure formed that became a catalyst to make one thing. Okay, well, you made one molecule. So what from that, that one catalyst? But what is the probability of having that and having time? So people will talk about this with RNA all the time. Well, if you just have one strand of RNA, if you have a 600 mer of an identical sample of RNA, say RNA at room temperature has a half-life of 100 days in water. It doesn't have a half-life of 100. It's much shorter than that, but we'll give them 100 days. That's 2,400 hours. For a single RNA strand, you have to convert a half-life to a probability, and it comes out to 2,400 hours divided by 600, you have 600 linkages, that's four hours. So if the right RNA happened to form somewhere in some pool, it has four hours now to have all the other reagents that it's going to need added to it. Well, where'd all those other reagents come from? Who knows? It's not like you can wait around millions of years waiting for those reagents to come. 
If you have a 200 mer polypeptide, that'll have a lifetime of about 13 days. Nobody's ever solved the problem with, the, uh, with half of the amino acids needing side chain protection when you polymerize these. All of these in red circles have very reactive side chains. All of the ones in dashed circles have somewhat reactive side chains. So half of the amino acids are really problematic in polymerization because it doesn't have just two arms to hook on to make a polymer. It has a third arm. And that third arm keeps getting in the way. It keeps swinging around and getting in the main chain. As soon as you do that, boom, it's over. <clears throat> Can't use it. Nobody's ever solved the code problem. What is the code for building a cell? That may be prescribed in DNA. And we're going to see at the end of this, it's much more detailed than just DNA being the blueprint of life. Where is that code? What's that code prescribed in? So if I give you a little, a little uh, memory stick for your computer, and I give it to you, I say, here, here, here's the memory stick. And you say, oh, you, you, you gave me a copy of your talk on there? No, but that's just the memory stick. But if nothing's been written to it, it has no code. If you just have a string of molecules, it has no code. You have to have a huge code to des describe how to make all of these things. Just RNA itself has no code. It's like an empty memory stick. It has to be programmed to have a code. Nobody's ever solved the code problem. That's a huge problem. Why is it that nobody ever addresses that? Because it can't be solved. Not today, maybe in 100 years, maybe in 500 years. Nobody's ever shown that life could form with lower enantiomeric excess mixtures, thereby mitigating the need for chiral-induced spin selectivity. Na natural systems are amazing, utterly amazing. You can have two hydroxyl radicals go across a parallel triplet surface and give you oxygen and two protons. Or the same two hydroxyl radicals go across an anti-parallel surface and give you hydrogen peroxide. This is what nature can pull off. People don't know how to do this. And what we have just learned in the last 25 years is that each one of these electrons has a spin that we knew, but that spin is controlled going down a environment that is chiral, that is, say, helical in a sense. And it only allows certain electrons of the proper spin to go through and not the ones with the improper spin. We don't know how to control that chemistry in our laboratories. Nature does that all the time. Natural systems do that. And that's why natural systems are so selective. So what, what some, some uh, uh, origin of life people have claimed and some silly YouTubers claim along with them is that you could have had uh, mixtures, and then later on evolution in, in a living cell cleared up those mixtures. What we learn now is you never could have had life start with those mixtures. You had to have near 100% enantiomeric excess from the start. So nobody's ever explained the requisite protein folding problem. So now that you have a protein, say you, the sequence is very hard to get, and you, you know if you have a a, a, a 200 mer, I mean, the, the possibilities of this, you don't have enough time in, 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 in uh, the lifetime of the universe to get the string the right sequence. But let's say you had the right sequence. Just a protein chain cannot be used. The protein has to fold into a certain pattern. That folding is generally done with the help of other enzymes, other proteins that are called foldamers that help it to fold. So if I just gave you a rope that was, say, 100 meters long, a rope, and I said, I want you to weave for me a hammock, a hammock that has, like, uh, say, one-inch openings in it with two rings, two loops at the end. Could you do that? Probably. I mean, you'd look it up on YouTube and see how to weave a hammock. But could you leave that 100-meter rope outside and expect it to weave a hammock? How about with a lot of wind and rain? Maybe a tornado. Would you get a hammock? Probably not. That's the protein folding problem. The proteins have to be able to fold in the right way or else they're unusable. So as these authors point out, uh, uh, even a single protein could not arrive at, at its native structure in biological real time by random search because conformational space is too vast. 
there's approximately 10 to the 95 possible conformations for a chain of 100 residues. 100 residues is a, is a short amino acid, a short protein. So that even a small protein that initiated folding by random search at the time of the Big Bang would still be thrashing about today. Remember, because if you're over 10 to the 40th, it can't happen in, in real time. So, so uh, um, that's the problem. Nobody's ever solved that. Leventhal 2.0. Just the intermolecular interactions, how they are arranged in a cell, is very important. You can't just throw all the parts in. Imagine taking all the parts of your car and just putting it in a pile and say, hey, there's my car. You like my car? It's not going to work very well because the parts aren't put together. They have to be aligned in the right way. Same with, 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 with uh, uh, this interactome problem. If you just consider the protein-protein interactions in a single yeast cell, it's estimated to be 10 to the 79 uh, uh, billion combinations. Remember, 10 to the 90th is the number of elemental particles in the universe. This is 10 to the 79 billion. This is not real. Nobody knows how to get those to line up with each other. And all information flows through electrostatic potentials of these things lining up. Why don't they ever address this? Because they can't. YouTubers will say, oh, come on, Tour's always pointing that out. Yeah, I point it out because it's a real problem. No scientists mock this. YouTubers mock this. Scientists do not mock this interactome problem because it is a real problem. Nobody's ever made any of the higher order structures needed for the simplest cell. So bioengineers have computationally figured out how simple a cell could be and be alive. Right? A living cell have those characteristics of life. Because people will say, oh, well, the cells at the start were really simple, and then they got more complex. Okay, well, how simple could they be and still have life? This is the minimal gene set that you have to have. All of these pieces, you need DNA replication, repair, restriction, modification, a basic transcription machinery, amino acyl tRNA synthesis, tRNA maturation modification. Silly YouTubers will say, oh, well, the earlier cells didn't even have DNA. Okay, strike this. What about all these other things? You know how many of these have been made in laboratories? How many of these have been made in, in laboratories by any prebiotic synthetic route? Zero. Not a single one. Very few of these have been made ab initio even in modern laboratories because they will take all these pieces from living cells and then maybe modify them and say, hey, here's a new one. But you, you cheated you, because Prebiotically, you would never have that life to begin with. That's why I say prebiotically, nobody's made any of these. Okay, nobody's come close to synthesizing or even suggesting how to synthesize the simplest of cells in a modern laboratory, let alone providing a sufficient suggestion on how the universe could have done it in 100 million years or 14 billion years. 14 billion years is the estimated lifetime that scientists will say that our universe has been around, but life... 100 million years. 100 million is a very small number relative to 14 billion. All right, give it 100 million years. Nobody's even, no, nobody can suggest this. How about 14 billion? Nobody has even a suggestion. I'm not, I'm not asking you to prepare life. I'm just saying to suggest how it could be made. Nobody knows. Nobody, even if given all the four classes of molecules in any order, so you're given the informational code because you have the order, could prepare even the simplest of cells. They refuse to answer the question. They remain silent. I was at a talk not too long ago. A big origin of life researcher was asked by somebody in the audience, not me. Okay, so you have all of these pieces. You can get all of the pieces from a cell. How come you haven't assembled a cell yet if you have all of these pieces? And he said, well... A career is four score. I'm really three and a half score into this. I'll leave this to the younger guys. <laughs> I mean, he, he really thinks we're idiots. He really thinks we're idiots that we're going to buy that argument. You could give, you could take a cell and you can deconstruct a cell. You can take the DNA out of it. You can take the RNA. You can take all the different components. And if you leave the DNA intact, now you've got the code. 
so they're all in different flasks. And I'm not asking you to do this in a puddle or by an ocean vent or under a rock. In your modern laboratory, could you take these pieces that we know came from a living cell and put the cell back together? Nobody would ever claim that they can do that. If anybody could do that, they would win a Nobel Prize that year, that same year. So even if they had all the pieces, they can't construct a cell. That's how clueless we are on the origin of life. Here's five of many areas that need to be addressed to make life. I had a 60-day challenge that came out in August. I gave 10 researchers because I, I had had a debate with a silly YouTuber, and every Thing I asked him, he threw up the name of a paper which didn't even address the question. Ah, oh, here's a paper that says, didn't, the question was very specific. So I said, okay, I can't deal with people that know no chemistry. I have to deal with people that understand chemistry. So I chose 10 people, many of them the people that this YouTuber was citing his articles, citing their articles, and I said, okay, I'll give you all the canonical chiral amino acids, nucleotides, monosaccharides, and 100% enantiomeric purity. I will give them to you. And I said, if you can just answer five questions that you need to, what's at stake? I will take down all of my content on Origin of Life from my YouTube channel, and I'll never speak publicly about Origin of Life again, and I'll leave you guys alone. And here were the five questions, the same questions that I gave in a recent debate. And the five questions were this. Just you don't have to make polypeptides. You see, they'll keep saying, oh, you can make polypeptides by heating them in water. No, that's not the question. Remember, remember when you were in school, you had to answer the question, not just any question you wanted to answer? <laughs> the question is very specific. How can you take aspartic acid and lysine and couple them together to get the dimer, DK, where this amino acid couples to that carboxylic acid without interference from that, without interference from that? and you have to get at least 90% yield. You say, 90% yield, that's really high. No, to make any condensation polymerization, you better have 99.999% yield. But I'm only asking for 90% yield. And note that the free energy is positive, which means the reaction phase favors the starting material and not the product. And can you do this? It's a very specific question. It's not making polypeptides. It's just making a dipeptide. That's it, just a dipeptide. Do that. That's what I challenge them to do. The second question is to make a 200-mer. Polymerize, I'm giving you the nucleotide. Just polymerize this, make a 200-mer without competition from this 2-5 linkage, the, 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 this 2 prime, 5 prime linkage, breaking this off and making branches without any branches off the 2 prime. That's all you have to do because you say you've made RNA all the time. Okay, do it in a prebiotically relevant manner in your lab. Question number three, make a disaccharide. Just hook together two glucoses. Very specific, not a polysaccharide. Just a disaccharide, just the dimer. Let alone the big molecules that we're made of. Just do that. The, third que the fourth question was, come up with specified information. Silly YouTubers don't know what specified information is. They think that this is something from the Discovery Institute. It is not. Leslie Orgel, a, a origin of life researcher, was the second to mention specified information that has a real meaning in the origin of life literature. And it actually predates Leslie Orgel. And, and uh, not Shannon information, but specified information embedded in the sequences. Where does the information come from in the polypeptides, polynucleotides, or polysaccharides? Account for the origin of the specified information. That was the fourth question. The fifth question it was, assuming you had access to all the polypeptides, polynucleotides, polysaccharides, and the lipids of your choice, could your research group, not a mindless early earth now, your research group, assemble those in your lab into an integrated functional living system, namely a cell? That's what I challenge them to do. And these are, the, remember, these are the things you have to have in order to have life. So I sent it to these 10 researchers, and, and uh, uh, none of them responded right away except Lee Cronin. And I'll show you what his reply to me. Steve Benner, a little while later, came and he said, oh, you know, if you had given me what you gave that YouTuber in, the t in, in your debate, I wouldn't have even needed any slides. I could have described how life could form within the hour. I said, oh, really? How about we do this? We're gonna, I'll be having this another, another event at Harvard. You come at, at, to Harvard and explain that. Now, mind you, in my field, when, you're in the, when you get an invitation to Harvard, you go. You go. All 10 of these people were invited. 
Only Lee Cronin went. The other nine didn't go. But Steve Banner said, no, I don't have time. I said, okay, Steve, I will fly to your institute in Florida, and I will sit there for an hour. I'll sit there for three hours, and you explain it to me, and I'll only ask you a question when I don't understand. You can have your whole institute explaining it to me. He wouldn't allow it. I mean, these people think that we're idiots. That we're just going to stand back, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe you. You really know how to do this. Uh -huh. No way. So Lee Cronin wrote this to me. He says, I don't even agree with the questions. The emergence of life goes way beyond those narrow questions. Okay? So we'll see more from this. Well, Lee wrote a previous tweet, and he said in October 28, 2021, origin of life research is a scam. So somebody asked him, Dr. Matt Hunt asked, why? Why are you saying that? You work in the area of origin of life. He says, because no one is really trying to actually answer the question or think it can be done. Sounds like a reasonable answer. Nobody's really trying to answer the question and think it can be done. I actually agree with him. Nobody's really trying to answer this question. Should I make this a little piece? Nobody's trying to answer the question. And nobody really even thinks it can be done. That, that's a thoughtful answer. Well, now he claims that that was just tongue-in-cheek when he said origin of life research was a scam. And just recently has claimed, well, he had too much to drink before he wrote that. You think he got some pushback from the origin of life community? Because it's now it's not just Jim Tour saying these sorts of things, it's Lee Cronin. Well, then he tried to explain his tweet. So let's look what he said. He later claimed it was tongue in cheek. And then he explained what he really meant by the scam. This is a quote, the whole thing. The scam is, he wrote this, the scam is, if we just make this RNA, we've got this. Let's now make this molecule and another molecule. And how many molecules are going to be enough? Go back to Craig Venter when he said, I've invented life. Not quite. He facsimiled the genome from this entity and made it in a lab, but he didn't make a cell. He had to go take an existing cell that had a causal chain going back all the way to LUCA. LUCA is, is, is the, the last universal common ancestor, meaning what was the original cell? That's what LUCA means. What was the first cell to form from which was the progenitor of all the other cells? He says, but it's remarkable that he could not make a cell from scratch. And even now today, synthetic biologists cannot make a cell from scratch because there is some contingent information embodied outside the genome in the cell. Yes, there's some information outside the genome of the cell that must have programmed that precisely, Lee. Pre precisely. And then he wrote, so there's lots of layers to the scam. That's his explanation. That's a great explanation. He wasn't saying here he had too much to drink. He said, this is a thoughtful answer. I agree with him. Lee Cronin sounds like Jim Tour. I feel like, like the man's been born again. <laughs> this, is, this is really a thoughtful answer. And I agree with this. I agree with every bit of this. I agree with it. I've, I've, I've said the same thing about Craig Venter's work. So then he comes out with assembly theory. And assembly theory explains and quantifies selection and evolution. And so th this is, uh, uh, just came out in October. And he spoke about this when we had our event at Harvard. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it. And a lot of people didn't understand it, but we were to there to talk about the origin of life, and he was going to explain to us uh, about the origin of life, how life could have come about. And there's lots of things written about this article. I mean, it says it's a groundbreaking theory of everything, unites physics and evolution. Theory of everything. It, it's been said, assembly theory, bridging physics and biology to de decode evolution and complexity. So there's a lot there. And so he shows pictures like this, where he has these amino acids forming a polypeptide. Now, I asked him about this at Harvard. I said, I don't understand. Where is the chemistry to get these to hook up? Where's the hookup chemistry? He says, well, I wasn't really meaning molecules. But you showed molecules. I mean, this is so confusing. Then he, I said, I don't understand how these things hook up. What's going on here? And so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I will give him assembly theory. Let's say assembly theory describes how origin of life can be made. All right? We'll give it to him. I don't understand. I'm not an informatician. All right? So, Professor Cronin now argues that my 60-day challenge that I gave 
The list, he says, was backwards. Recently he's come out, he says, my list, where, remember I said, I want you to make this dipeptide, then I want you to make this 200 mer of RNA, and I want you to make this disaccharide, and then deal with information and deal with building of cell. He says the list was backwards. A simple cell started somehow, and evolution selected for information and the subsequent reactions, or it all started at the same time. Because here's what he said. He says to the five challenge question, they're actually, and, and it's at, at, the, at this YouTube site, they're all actually connected together. And you should start at the base, meaning the cell, and that is why James is doing it the wrong way around. Okay, start at the cell. A simple cell formed, and then how did that, where was the refinement of the information? And then the selective chemistries came around, or all of the above happened at the same time. I'm good with that. All right, let's take it your way, Lee. So I'm extending the 60-day challenge to the three-year challenge for assembly theory. Giving it a three-year challenge. I'm just announcing that tonight here. Live stream on the internet. I'm announcing it here. A three-year challenge for assembly. He first published his first paper, as I, as I recall, was in 2017 related to assembly theory. And the big paper just came out this year. So he's been working on this since 2017. And here we are in, in 2024. So, so he's, he's had seven years. And here we are in this three-year challenge. And what are we going to do? I predict that assembly theory will not afford a de demonstrative, prebiotically relevant method to make a cell that bears the characteristics of life. I don't think he's going to be able to have it. I don't think he'll have life. Or generate specified information that improves the cell, affords the desired regio and stereoselective glucose dimerization, selectively synthesizes a 200 more RNA from the nucleotides, selectively affords aspartic acid lysine, DK, without side chain coupling. These must be predicted by assembly theory and then demonstrated in a laboratory under prebiotically relevant conditions. For the assembly theory to be valid, it's got to make predictions. And then you can go in the laboratory and follow that. All right? There it is. There's the challenge. Three years I'll give you. You want to start with the cell? Start with the cell. You want to do them all at the same? Do them all at the same time. Go ahead. You got your computer program? Make it happen. What's the stakes for the th three-year challenge to assembly theory? And remember, th these are the characteristics of life. The, th this, is, this is the textbook characteristics. Here's Cronin's definition that I had quoted to you earlier on in the talk. He says, so what are the requirements for a living system? We need genetic code. We need mating. We need metabolism. We need adaptation. We need homeostasis. Homeostasis is, is this, this constant uh, 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 balance that we have between all the molecules going on in a cell to keep us operating. So he's got to do that. So if assembly th theory can deliver any of any one of the five challenges within a simple cell that has the characteristics of life, if it can do any one, he doesn't have to do all five, just one, just one, I will stop quoting an origin of life researcher when he said origin of life researcher is a scam. I'll stop quoting Professor Cronin. Cronin. He, he says he, he wants to have a deceased, a deceased letter coming at me to, to stop quoting him. I don't know, maybe in the UK you can do that, but I don't think that's going to get very far in the courts in the US. You can certainly quote people. Origin of life research is a scam. I love that quote. Uh, uh, and I'll stop saying it if you just solve any one of these five. I will remove all the content of origin of life from my YouTube channel and never publicly speak about origin of life again. If you solve any one of, if assembly theory solves any one of those five in three years. If assembly theory cannot deliver on any of the five challenges in three years, then I will claim assembly theory is the grand scam. <laughs> All right? That's what I'm going to uh, 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 proclaim here. That's the problem with what's going on here. Are we past the hype? Well, this is an article that just came out March 4th this year. We may finally know how the first cells on Earth formed. And then you look at the paper. And they're, 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 they're making lipids, and lipids form, form a, a, a vesicle, something that has been known for a long, long time. A vesicle is not a cell, all right? So we're not past the hype. But am I seeing any progress? Am I doing all this for nothing? No, I think some scientists are coming around. Here's two recent articles that have come out. Science is slowly evolving, actually. There's an article that came out 
says, to unravel the origin of life, treat findings as pieces of a bigger puzzle. And so this is written by Nick Lane and Joanna Xavier. Nick Lane is at University College London, and Joanna is at Imperial College London. And here's what they write. The origin of life is one of the greatest challenges in science. There is no consensus about what to look for or where. So this idea that scientists are making great headway and they're all agreeing on moving this, that's garbage. There's no consensus. Most scientists agree that these nanomachines are the product of selection. But selection for what, where, and how? This is the whole thing I've been saying. They don't know what to select for. They don't know to move toward life. It's not like the mob, let's, let's build a living system today. They don't know. And these people are saying it. So, so Lane and Xavier are saying, select for what, where, how? Refraining from the hype might seem unrealistic, but could work for research work if researchers implemented this practice in their roles as peer reviewers for papers and grants, as, uh, uh, as well as authors. All right, another paper came out recently. This one by, by Dennis Noble from University of Oxford. He was, he, it's entitled, It's Time to Admit that Genes Are Not the blu Blueprint for Life. It's much more than just the DNA, much more than just the DNA being this blueprint. And he was commenting on a book written by Philip Ball that just came out this year. Philip Ball is a former editor for Nature. He, he's, he's no longer an editor, but he still writes a lot for Nature. He wrote a book, How Life Works, A User's Guide to New Biology. So here's what Noble writes. He says, we are at the beginning of a profound rethinking of how life works. It is time to stop pretending that give or take a few bits and pieces, we know how life works. Instead, we must let our ideas evolve as more discoveries are made in the coming decades. Sitting in uncertainty while working to make those discoveries will be biology's great task for the 21st century. These people are coming around. They're seeing what I am seeing. He says we need a profound rethinking and it's time to stop pretending. That's what these guys do, pretend. Professor Cronin came out on that YouTube video and he just talked all sorts of fluff. It sounded to me like a biologist. Biologists talk all sorts of fluff. Well, this happened and then this happened. And, this, and he pointed, well, that couldn't happen. Oh, well, well, then this happened. I mean, it's story time. Story time. And that's exactly what he was doing. So now reduce your story time in assembly theory to a three-year challenge. You got three years. You already got the program. Three years. You want me to start with the cell? Okay, start with the cell. Work your way back. Start with them all together, however you want. I've already given you all the canonical amino acids, all the canonical uh, 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 building blocks of the building blocks in, in stereo pure form. So you already got that. Go ahead, build your cell. You have to stop pretending. And we are sitting in uncertainty. We can do research, but we have to sit in certainty, and it will be our great task for the 21st century to stop saying that we've got this thing solved. So, my suggestion to see progress in the field of origin of life research is to stop overambitious projections regarding the state of the field. Do not abandon the basic reactions of chemistry and concede that we do not yet have sufficient we not yet sufficiently understand chemical reactions to project them toward life there are enormous scientific mysteries yet to unfold in a hundred years we will be making molecules like child's play because we'll learn more about how to do this we'll learn more about how to capture chiral induced spin cell activity and then we can project that back to a prebiotic system it might be hundreds of years away. And the clock starts today on the three-year challenge to assembly theory. Good luck. All right, with that, I'm going to take questions. And before I do that, let me just make one other comment. If you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, this is an invitation to people who do not believe. Many Christians write to me, they would like an hour with me just to talk. I, I just can't do it. I mean, you're going to have to schedule this with my wife. And, and uh, but if you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, you send me an email to tour at drjamestour.org, tour at drjamestour.org, and I will meet with you for an hour to tell you why I embrace the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is my invitation to the unbeliever. I don't take them by referral. You can't say, call my son and do this. 
your son needs to write to me and request the meeting, and I will meet with your son. Okay, that's the way it works. With that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Yeah, get, get the microphone because this is being live streamed so people will be able to hear your question. You're going live on YouTube right now. Did you know that? It says it is. Okay. So we're t you're talking about the origin of life, but what about the chemistry of it? Uh, where, where did all that come from? You're, you're, you're giving the hydrogen and the oxygen and carbon or whatever. So, so you're looking at the chemistry uh, before there's any life just kind of coming together. Where did all that come from? So where did the chemicals come from? Mm -hmm. Is that the question? Where did the basic yeah. chemicals come from? Okay, so the idea is that on a prebiotic earth, that there were basic chemicals here. Cyanide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, uh, small molecules like acetone. You say, well, where, are those, where might those have come from? Well, what happens is the earth has an atmosphere, and it underwent a heavy bombardment, a late heavy bombardment. Our planet is covered in, in elements that, I mean, so many elements. Of, of the hundred or so elements in the periodic table, uh, we've got the vast majority of them here. How did that happen? It's because our planet was pelted in late heavy bombardment by, by meteors. And uh, uh, if you look at the moon that doesn't have an atmosphere, you see these pockmarks. That's what this planet would look like if it didn't have an atmosphere to smooth it out. So we have, we have elements from all over the universe that have slammed into this place, and this is why our Earth is so rich in elements. With those elements came certain small organic molecules that form on impact, that form through, through, through just... The elements themselves had to be made of something. How do elements arrange? If you have carbon, Carbon, you know, it's heated up, it starts forming bonds with one another. So some of these can form spontaneously. So, so um, in this, the, there is, there's good reason to believe that we had many of the basic raw chemicals. Now, you take those raw chemicals and you want to make now the building blocks of the building blocks. You want to make the amino acids, you want to make the, the, the saccharides, which are the sugars, and you want to make the nucleotides. It's not easy, but it can be done in a modern laboratory. How that happened on early Earth, we don't know. Miller-Urey had the Miller-Urey experiment where he took some simple molecules and he gave some, some voltage pulses and he got some amino acids to form. He got a lot of amino acids to form. He got a lot of other junk too. They would have been unusable because they were filled with other junk and they would have been unusable because they were, they were racemic and not, not, uh, uh, not enantiopure or even enantioenriched. But that tells us where basic chemicals could have come from. Uh, if, if you have access, if you could turn on the, the speakers up here, because it's hard for me to hear the questions because I, I wasn't getting, a, wasn't getting any, any feedback well up here. Okay, so let's presume for a moment that the universe is 14 billion years old. And it started with the Big Bang, okay? The amount of energy that was released in the Big Bang might have actually destroyed all of these chemicals that actually started at some point, in some way. How do we explain that? Yeah, so, yeah, there was an awful lot of energy in that event. Uh, you, you hit elements with a lot of energy, they often form small molecules. <laughs> it's kind of what they do. And uh, uh, so you can, you can actually take a chunk of carbon, chunk of carbon, and you can blast it with, with high energy pulses and you will see small molecules forming. So it's if, if it's in certain gases in the environment, if it's under nitrogen, it'll make carbon nitrogen compounds. So you have a lot of energy hitting upon elements, you will get the small molecules. You won't get the molecules that we need for life, but you get a lot of small molecules. Now, if you hit them long enough, you will occasionally see a molecule related to life and molecule. But these are just one up sort of things. Uh, but you'll never see the polymers thereof, Th those we don't see. And that, that's the polymerization problem. That's why, rather than argue about the small molecules, I give them the building blocks of the building blocks, also in chiral form. So I don't have to deal with that frustration anyway, because just making the polymeric forms is difficult enough. 
Every one of the questions in my five questions that I gave the experts, everyone is unanswerable. You think I'm going to give them p questions that can be answered? I mean, there's no way. I mean, professors know how to write questions that, can, <laughs> that there's no solution to. And, uh, but all of those have to be solved. But those are five of 5,000 that could be asked. But the small molecules, I'm giving them that. But yeah, you hit a bunch of elements with, with high energy. They'll form small molecules. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask, uh, do you think that any of the recent changes we've seen in technology, whether it ranges from AI to uh, mRNA for fighting COVID, do any of those provide um, methodologies to get closer to answers, or are they one-offs that are No, are no, I, 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 I think AI could contribute a lot to this. And then, but, it, so it, it can make suggestions. It cannot go into the laboratory and... People need to do that. So people are going to have to take those answers from AI and start trying to do this, but AI can have at it. Let them have at it. Presumably, uh, the assembly theory, if it doesn't have AI parts of its program, it's going to have it. Have at it. You would have all the AI you want. Have at it. You've got three years. <laughs> uh, hello. Um I recently did a small talk. I'm, on, I'm having trouble hearing. I'm sorry. You. I recently did a small talk on uh, God's providence and mankind's suffering, and I chose the HeLa cell as the uh, uh, source of my talk. Uh, could you tell me because in some of my research I found, or at least it was said that they were in the process of creating this immortal cell, what they call immortal cell, that science science was in the process of creating new immortal cells. Uh, could you tell me how does that work with the... So, so scientists are making immortal cells. Is well, we're talking about the HeLa cell, first of all. Uh, could, could you repeat what she said because I'm having trouble hearing, hearing her? Could, could you repeat it? Or, okay, go ahead. Say. I'm speaking of the HeLa cell. Yes. Okay. Um, I was doing some research and the scientists were... And here again, quote, unquote, scientists... I uh, was saying that they were... This in, is, yeah, in this is very common. With HEMA cells, you can immortalize them. So in other words, th th that just means that you... It's, it's not that the cell can't die. It's that you take a cell line and you, 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 you make it so that that cell line is a progenitor for all the researchers that are going to be using it after that point. So you immortalize that cell line. So you can take a cell line from a person, and that's, for example... Uh, 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 what, 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 what has actually been done in many cell lines from a particular person or a particular animal, and forever you use that as the genesis point for providing cells to common researchers. So they're all using the exact same cell line. So that cell, it made a, a bunch of other cells, and you take those cells and you have them make more cells, and you have this company do this more and more, and they start sending it out to researchers. So everybody is working off of a common cell line. That's what, the, that's what they mean when they say that. Okay? So that, that's common. Very common. Easy to do. But they're not making life. And, by, and, and it's not that those cells live forever. It's just that they keep, keep having offspring. Because, and then the offspring have offspring. And the offspring have offspring. That's what that means. Doctor, would, would you ex explain in, in, in just a, a little bit more detail the, the, pro the problems with chiro-induced spin selectivity and, and how, how that complicates the current situation and what, what, outs what force determines the direction uh, of the spin? And, and, and directs it, uh, and I don't mean to be the, to uh, beg the question, but... Yeah, so chiral induced spin selectivity is showing us that we could not have had terrible mixtures early on in early living systems. The idea was in an early cell, you could have, you don't have to worry about stereochemistry, and it just purified, it got better. That was, for example, that silly YouTuber, that's what he has suggested in his YouTubes that, oh, you know, the, these things were just, just uh, 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 
didn't have any chiral, it, it, it didn't, didn't have any enantiopurity, and then evolution took over. Every, everything, everything that can't be explained is thrown at the feet of evolution. How did that happen? Evolutionarily. And everybody said, oh, okay. So th 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 this is what they say. But now we know evolution never could have begun because you never could have had the first life because it di you didn't have high enantiopurity. So the, only, the, the reason why cells don't burn up, cells do an enormous amount of chemistry and they don't burn up, it's because of chiral-induced spin cell activity because they select the proper spin state to go down an environment. If you have the improper spin state, you get a lot of backscattering and it generates heat. And this is why cellular systems, natural systems, living systems can work so efficiently. Whereas in the laboratory, we just blow out heat and our yields aren't that good. We don't know how to control that. We're just learning how to control that now as we learn what living systems do. And the chirality comes because when you have a homochirality, it means that, that most polymer chains, when they are chiral, they will form a, a coil. And that coil can be a right-handed coil or a left-handed coil. And that is dependent upon the constituents that make it up. And so, so uh, uh, you have both of those in living systems. And uh, in one place you have one, in one place you have another, and you can control these spins. So we know, we know from this that, that uh, uh, we've had to have had high enantiopurity early on. It's not something that could have been evolved into later. Uh, Dr. Turr, it seems like uh, to a non-scientist that the more we, we learn, we're learning what we don't know, and the, the target is moving away from us as, we, as uh, scientists continue to, to work in this area. They learn more what they don't know, and the problem is getting more difficult, more complex, and the answer seems to be farther away from us in, in time, uh, assuming that it's answered. Is, is that a correct assumption? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. So, so what happens is, is um, when Miller Urey came up with this, they thought that, that the origin of life answer was gonna be just around the corner, but what happens is the more we learn about the cell, the more the target now moves away. It's not because the cell is evolving, it's because we learn about the complexity of the cell. So for example, when we learned about chiral induced spin cell activity 25 years ago, and now we're learning that all the molecules had to be, have high enantiopurity to begin with, the cell target now moved far away from us, much further than it was. So we're, we may be inching nanometers closer, and this cell is just moving, you know, you know kilometers, further away uh, because of the complexity of the cell. And this is why this article, for example, by, by um, Dennis Noble really pulls this apart. He said, De Dennis, Dennis Noble, he, he, he's an honest guy, and, 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 and uh, uh, he's a, a, a biologist, and he's really an amazing guy. But he says, look, we gotta stop pretending here. We don't understand this, we, uh, how life works, because what's happening, it's not just the DNA, there's levels upon levels, and the DNA, the, what, the chemistry that happens in a cell is not just following a blueprint of DNA. It depends so much of the external environment, things coming at us, and there's so many levels of information changes that go on, behavioral patterns. When someone, you, you know, when, when we're exposed to certain things, it changes chemistry that goes on in our bodies, and probably what we're going to find is even emotionally, emotionally, these changes are modifying what's going to be happening in a cell. And that's why emotionally, you know, somebody hurts our feelings and, you know, this huge organism is all of a sudden dejected just because somebody said words that vibrated something in my ear, you know, and, and, and uh, now it's changing chemistry in my body. Yeah, so there's all of these different levels of change, and so it's not nearly as simple as we thought. And so we're working in a whole world of uncertainty. He says, sitting in uncertainty while making these discoveries is going to be our greatest task, because we love to pontificate and say, oh, we understand that. You know, basically, 
like Bender said, you know, most of the paradoxes in Origin of Life have been solved. Come on. No, that's nonsense. There's so much we don't know, and that's why we're not finding this thing. And it is, it is truly the silly little YouTubers that go around thinking, oh, you know, you know that, that, that we, we got this thing figured out and, and, and give you this simple little prescription because they don't understand the levels of the science. But you know, what I see, every synthetic organic chemist sees this. They all see it. And that's why Lee Cronin has stopped talking about the chemistry. He used to publish in that. He does it. He's talking about these generalities. So now he can talk like a biologist. Biologists fly over 30,000 feet and they say, hey, yeah, it's simple. You get down into the weeds there. You get down into the nano world and it becomes very, very tough. And you can't just throw out these silly little stories anymore. It's, 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 it's uh, never, never land story time. Could you speak to the uh, complexity of the, even if you have a cell, you have to protect the cell. So you've got a cell membrane and the complexity of a cell membrane in homeostasis. So you've got the, the exit of the, uh, uh, of the bad stuff and the entrance of the good stuff. Right, so yeah, the lipid bilayer. So all these silly little protocell experiments where they say this is a protocell because we have a lipid bilayer. The lipid bilayer is very far from the, the, the membrane of a cell. A cell has transmembrane proteins that allow materials to come in and materials to go out. So, for example, if, if we, we respirate, it's allowing oxygen to come in and it's pr putting CO2 out. This is, this is how we respirate. And, and so every... It allows certain ions in and certain ions out. And you have channels that allow only certain ions in. I mean, these, these are amazing. This is all nanotechnology. And, and, and it's, it's really amazing how biological systems work. So all these protocell experiments are idiotic because just having a vesicle with a bunch of garbage inside doesn't do anything. You have to have the transmembrane proteins. And silly little YouTubers will say, well, they were leaky. The membranes were leaky and therefore they worked because it allowed things in. Yeah, it allowed anything in and it's gonna die. It's not gonna be able to take off. I mean, the, the, these folks are just clueless. It's so hard to have a conversation with them because everything they say is wrong, everything. But scientists are a lot more careful about this, but they'll write their papers and they get accepted. But when you poke them on this, they don't wanna answer. They don't wanna answer. And this is why it's very hard to get them to engage with me. I have to pay a lot of money to get them to engage with me. Yeah, I have to buy their engagement. Do you have a Bible study? Yeah, I have a Bible study. I, I do it on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. And uh, it's the college students and it's also by Zoom. So if you just went to my website, jmtour.com or just Google James Tour, it'll come up. On the first page there is the link to get onto the Bible study if you wanted to come. There's a question there in the back. It's more of a comment rather than Could a question. Could you hold that closer? It's more of a comment than a question. It seems that you find yourself in your discipline in the same way that we find politics in America. It's a matter of control, media, and those who want to remain in power. And so you're fighting an uphill battle all the way because you have the media against you and you have your colleagues against you because their interest is in maintaining control, not in truth. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with that. There's a question over here. I'm getting my work out. So I was wondering about when you said uh, mRNA uh, basically will, what, demolish in four hours? Well, then that puts the question in my mind about, so what about the mRNA? V-A-C-C-I-N-E, 
I won't say the word. Uh, how about that? You mean the mRNA vaccine? Yes. <laughs> okay, so, so no, no, that, that's an interesting question. So remember it had to be kept cold and it was in a freezer at minus 80 degrees. It was shipped very, very cold. But it also, a lot of chemistry went into that. So it was put in a liposome. It was put in a lipid bilayer vesicle. And so it was packed in that vesicle and, and a lot more was packed in that vesicle than what was needed to account for the degradation over the couple of day period in transit till it was used and then it's kept very cold. So, so normally RNA, it's gonna be kept at minus 80 degrees and, and uh, RNAs are particularly uh, sensitive not just to uh, not just to, to water, but then you have, you have, you have uh, particularly magnesium ion will destroy it very quickly. And so there's a, a, a number of chelators in there, like EDTA, that trap divalent ions that keep them from reacting with the mRNA. But just, just water, ju ju just water uh, 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 can certainly hydrolyze this. That's why it's kept cold and it was packed in a vesicle and it was injected as the vesicle compound. So it was within the vesicle when it was injected. So that's how they stabilized it. But e even then, it, it, it had a fairly short s shelf life. And they didn't have one RNA molecule. Four hours is one RNA molecule. I said 100 days for RNA in solution. And I was gracious for 100 days. And, and, uh, uh, and that's why they, they, they pack it in a, in, in, a, in a vesicle and they cool it. We'll take two more questions. Yeah, uh, so I've heard from the atheist community that uh, due to some natural reactions, uh, spontaneously organisms form, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in some cases, maggots have been uh, claimed as an example, and there may be other organisms. So how do you respond to yeah, such you're, claims? You're, 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 I mean, you're reading from a children's textbook. I mean, this is not real. I mean, the, the whole maggots thing, so, so people thought that life formed spontaneously. You take a piece of meat and, and then maggots start growing on it. That, that, that was shown 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 150 years ago, that that was nonsense. That was because flies landed on it and dropped organisms on it. The, so so uh, uh, no, nobody, nobody, nobody in their right mind claims that life forms spontaneously. Nobody in their right mind. So if somebody has told you that, they are wrong. Okay? Whether it's a Christian or a non-Christian has nothing to do with it. They're just wrong. Okay? Last question. I'm still a little confused when we talk about the HeLa cell. And I like yeah, you've got to call that really close. Really when, close okay, really I'm close. really confused when you speak of the HeLa cells that uh, were taken from a woman post-mortem in 1951, and even today those cells live. And they are those cells that are sent around the world for research. Uh, and I know, you, of course, Harvard and, and all the universities are, are aware of this. The where I'm confused at is that these cells have been living for 72 years now. How, how long, first of all, do cells, when, a, when an individual die, how long do cells normally last or before they die? And then what was so unique about those cells? Also, are those cells, the cells today that they are now using in research to maybe further this thing about creating new cells? Yeah, M Madam, Madam, I'm, I'm sorry I can't answer your question because, because uh, uh, you're just not understanding me or I'm just not understanding you. I gave you that answer. When they say immortalized, it doesn't mean that that first cell is still alive. That is not what they mean. But, that, but, but, uh, uh, um, but I'm not a biologist. Probably best to speak to a biologist on that matter. Thank you. As I come forward, I'm gonna ask one question. Yes. 
Is it true that the more you, that scientists know, the further apart they are in putting these four chemicals together to make life? The more they know, the further away they get from making life. Is that the question? Yes, especially yes. with those four yes, chemicals. Yes, and it's, it's not because they didn't make a little bit of headway. It's because the cell, the target, is a moving target. The target is moving away from us because we learn about the complexity of the cell. The more we learn about the complexity, it's like, oh my goodness, I've got to make that too now to have this living cell. Oh, I've got to make that too. And oh, the interactome problem? I mean, we didn't learn about the interactome problem until like 15 years ago. So I got to deal with this 10 to the 79 billion? You know, how do I order these things? This is a, these are big, big problems. And it's not just a bunch of protoplasm in there. Yeah. I want to thank Dr. Tour very much. Our men's group will be uh, taking up a donation to give to his charity, which is basically his YouTube. Uh, if any of you would like to contribute to that, you can see me or you can see Brent, and we'll make sure that that goes toward that. He has done this on his own for us with no gratis, no fees. So let's thank him one more time. Okay, and if I, if I could just mention one thing on that. so the. It, there's the Jesus and Science Foundation that supports my YouTube channel. We have no, it's a 501c3. We have no employees. Everything is gratis. I donate my time. I have friends that donate accounting time, legal time. The only thing that we have to pay for is contracting the production work for the YouTube channel and for our radio, radio outreach. And, uh, and so that's why it's a 501c3. So if you, you can give directly to that, or you can give directly under the YouTube videos. There's a, there's a box to donate to, to the Jesus and Science Foundation that supports all of that work. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.